you got to have that solid basis to build on so that even if you need to go into maintenance mode for three months where like you're not going to be learning that extended technique that maybe you always wanted to work on or something like that, you can still function, you can still be a decent player, you can still do what you need to do. Hi, I'm Sean Perrin. And you're listening to the Clarinet Podcast, the show for clarinetists looking for in-depth, career-accelerating conversations about all that's neat for clarinet. On today's show, I'm joined by Rachel Yoder, who is a Seattle-based clarinetist who performs a wide variety of solo, chamber, and large ensemble music. She's also the adjunct professor of music theory, chamber music, and clarinet at the DigiPen Institute of Technology, and editor of the ICA's The Clarinet Magazine. Today we are here to discuss making music during pregnancy and parenthood in general, but more specifically, some of the physical changes that women experience as clarinetists and how to overcome them. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all our sponsors and supporters for making the show today possible, and you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. Be sure to subscribe to Clarinet wherever you get your podcasts, tell your musical friends, students, and colleagues, and I do hope that you enjoy today's show. The new Bakun Q-Series clarinet features a completely redesigned bore inspired by the Bakun Custom Series clarinets. This means you can play and perform like the pros, but for less. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com to save 10% on your entire purchase and try the Bakun Q-Series or Protégé clarinet risk-free for 30 days. Just pay the return shipping if you aren't fully satisfied. Shop now at bakunmusical.com and use code CLARINET at checkout. Imagine a read that lets you focus on your music, lasts for months instead of days, and even saves you money in the long run. It's all possible with Legere Reads, the world's leading synthetic read brand made right here in Canada. The European cut read is preferred by Legere artists all over the world, including Eddie Daniels, David Schifrin, Crowd Giuffredi, and many others. It offers a warm, clean sound with a great ease of articulation and is now available for E-flat, B-flat, and the bass clarinet. Learn more at your local music store. Or you can now save 10% on your Legere reads with code CLARINET at checkout at Legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com. As musicians, we're always looking to improve our playing and understanding of music, but we are often hesitant to work on the business and marketing side. If you're looking to make more money teaching, fill up the gaps in your schedule and find ideal clients to work with who leave you energized instead of drained after a day of teaching, you need to check out clarinetist Kelly Reardon's Outside the Box community. Get a free 30-minute consultation and personalized recommendations from Kelly by mentioning Clarinet when you register at kellyreardon.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y-R-I-O. R-D-A-N dot com. Also, you might want to check out her recent podcast episode with me, number 174 of the Clarinet Podcast. Okay, so Rachel, thank you so much for coming on today. Just before we got started, I, I mentioned I had a kind of a funny story to start off with, and I think I'm going to do that. That just kind of shows the, I don't know if it's just me, but I think the disconnect a little bit between men and women and sort of pregnancy and the whole situation. <laughs> so I do want to get into your story of how you came to write this article, but first just this sort of f- funny anecdote just to get started here. So I was so disconnected when we had our first child that I actually booked a podcast interview on June 27th. And our child was due on June 26th. (laughs) But of course, the pregnancy ran long. And just after our daughter was born, I had to call this guest and say, hey, I'm so sorry I missed our interview because my wife was giving birth. (laughs) And he's like, what were you doing? Why would you schedule this today? And I'm like, you know what? I don't know. I think I need to change how I think now. (laughs) And so uh, I just thought I'd leave you with that to get started. And then, uh, but yeah, let's get to know you, your situation, how you got into writing this article. And then let's get into it. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think... um a lot of people, unless you've gone through uh, pregnancy and having a child, it's kind of hard to fathom all of the changes that happen uh, physically to your body and just to your life in general. And all parents experience this, of course, um, but especially uh, people who go through the pregnancy. You know, there's just physical changes that can affect so many different aspects of our life. And so I got really interested in researching what exactly what effect does pregnancy have on our bodies and our clarinet playing during and after pregnancy and how I got started onto this topic was kind of on a personal level so I have two sons they are five and eight now and during uh when I had my first son I played throughout the pregnancy came back fine afterwards no big deal Um, but after my second son was born 
I, I did come back to playing again really quickly afterwards. I think I was playing with the Yakima Symphony at like eight weeks postpartum, um, traveling and, you know, pumping and all that stuff. And of course, I was super busy having a three-year-old and a newborn and uh, freelancing and adjunct professor jobs and gigging and all that stuff. But I just felt like my sound never really came back into focus. I felt like something was up with my air and not just in clarinet playing, but in everyday life too. Just like I would be standing there doing the dishes or whatever and I just felt like I couldn't get a full breath. And due to life, I really didn't take care of myself until like I got to the next summer, almost a year after my son was born. And I said, I'm gonna check into some physical therapy and see, cause I know that helps a lot of people after they have a baby. And so I uh, ended up with a wonderful physical therapist uh, who specialized in pelvic floor and postpartum stuff and finally went to see her. And it was just like, uh, a light bulb, many light bulbs went off. She was so enthusiastic about trying to figure out what was going on with my clarinet playing. I ended up um, bringing my clarinet into her office. So like playing long tones in this medical office and hooked up to biofeedback devices and like doing kegels while I was playing and trying to figure out what was going on. And what she helped me realize was that after um, the pregnancy, I had been over relying on my rectus abdominis muscles, which are those six pack, you know, ab muscles that we think of um, that go vertically like this, rather than strengthening my sort of inner core, deeper core muscles like the transverse abdominis, which is low down below the belly button and um, it reintegrating that with the pelvic floor. And so I'll just like digress a minute into what those two muscles do, because I think it's so important and it's really impacts our air support. So the rectus abdominis attaches at your sternum and your pelvis, and it sort of stretches between those two. So if you tense that muscle, like your um, six pack muscle, like you're doing a crunch or something and try to take a deep breath, you can't. And I know like everybody, it, everybody's doing this now in their car, like wherever they're listening, you can't, your rib cage actually can't expand because it has to expand up and out a little bit. But if you engage the transverse abdominis, which is a little tricky if you've never done it, but it's the muscle that maybe if you're sitting down and you lift both your legs up and you can kind of feel down between your, um, like your pelvic bones that kind of might stick out deep down there, it stretches like this horizontally. It's the muscle you might use when you're trying to put on a tight pair of pants or something like that, sucking in down there. You can take a full breath while you're engaging that muscle. You can breathe in, you can breathe out, and it can stay activated. And so that muscle, um, I found in my research, actually takes longer to recover after pregnancy. So it might be common for other people to have the same experience I did where over relying on this muscle, um, the rectus abdominis, and then sort of feeling like you can't take a full breath or you can't engage as deeply as you need to. So anyway, that was my light bulb moment. Um, and it led me down the path of, wow, like if I'm experiencing this, what other kind of effects on clarinet playing are other people experiencing? And how long do people continue playing throughout their pregnancies? Like what's the percentages? And when do people usually come back? Because I had all these questions like, when am I gonna be able to play a gig? You know, what What can I plan for? Um, and so, yeah, that's what led me down the path of trying to study this with a survey um, and looking into some of the medical literature. Well, I find it so interesting, quite honestly, that when you started looking for more information about this or other research or something, that there, there really was none. And and I find it interesting for a few reasons. One is just because it seems so obvious that, like, in the history of wind playing, someone would have thought about, like, right. okay, no well, what happens to women during, <laughs> during and after pregnancy? pregnancy? Like, uh, it, there's a lot going on in there, of course, and the baby takes up a fair amount of room. And amazingly to me, I didn't know, but the organs, like, get all completely pushed around. Like, it's a very very different experience uh, for sure you know and I can't even relate but but um, it's surprising to me that there was no research not just from a practical perspective for the mother and the music um, and that sort of thing in the careers but but also for the safety I was going to ask was there any research about like the safety during pregnancy of, of exerting that kind of wind pressure or or energy or playing because I, I know that they say not to do certain types of exercise or I mean they get pretty paranoid it seems these days like don't eat mayonnaise 
don't have this, don't do that. I mean, people can really start to get paranoid, right? When in the past it was like, oh yeah, just have a cigarette, you'll be fine, <laughs> you know? But today it's like, oh my God, was there a piece of mayonnaise in that sandwich? I'm gonna die, you know, it's, it's very, yeah, it's very, there's a lot of stuff you gotta follow. And it was always very jarring because my wife both times went through um, uh, post, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, diabetes during pregnancy, gestational, gestational diabetes. diabetes yeah. And so that was very hard for her because like no carbs, no nothing, all your cravings you can't have. And I'm sitting there and I, I can't have a burger either or whatever because she can't. And it's like, would be rude, you know? So it's a lot of kind of working together in that way. But um, but yeah, I just thought about like the safety. Like, has there been any studies on that? Did you, were you able to find anything? Um, what I, the only thing I could really find, and I was really curious about that too. Um, I have some theories but the only thing I could really find was uh, a series of articles uh, from the medical literature about athletes, uh, female, specifically Olympic female athletes. They had done some studies on, you know, when they when they could return to Olympic running and things like that. And some studies on what happened to the muscles. And I, I really think there needs to be more done in this area. And one of my theories is that or that one of the links I sort of made in my research is that uh, there's a concept of intra-abdominal pressure. And so um, intra-abdominal pressure is kind of like the, the pressure of when you're lifting something heavy, um, things like that. And it's been shown that playing a wind instrument does increase your intra-abdominal pressure. And it's also been shown that uh, increasing that pressure can exacerbate issues like um, there can be prolapse uh, of different kinds, uh, even for, um, there's like an article on bagpipers hernia. So for for anybody who, you know, pregnancy aside, anybody who's uh, playing with a lot of pressure there, there's, I think there's an article also about trumpet playing maybe and, and hernia. You're putting that pressure and it can cause risks uh, for those organs involved. So after pregnancy, when you go home, they tell you like, don't pick up anything heavier than the baby, right? Or maybe if you have a C-section, they might even say, don't pick up the baby. So if you think about playing the clarinet, like that's gonna be a lot more pressure than just like picking up a baby or picking up something that's maybe 15 or 20 pounds. So it's still a big question for me. Like if you play too soon before those muscles have had a chance to re-strengthen, could that cause or maybe like worsen or slow the recovery of um, for things like diastasis recti? That's one of those other fun pregnancy things that happens where the, the rectus abdominis, which we were talking about, it sort of splits in the middle or it, it pulls apart. And almost every, every woman experiences this to some extent during pregnancy or every person. And then it, it just sort of naturally heals, but for, um, and comes back together, but for some people it does not and you need to do some physical therapy and things to help it come back together so is the pressure good for that situation probably not um but i'm not a medical expert I've, i'm just a kind of a, an investigator going on this crazy uh rabbit hole which i said is more like a ground sloth hole it's like this giant hole of <laughs> uh of um topics related to pregnancy well, it's one of those things like I heard um, just, you know, again, I'm also not a medical professional, but I, I had heard that if you are like, let's say, a distance runner or an athlete of some kind who lifts weights to maintain your lifestyle during most of the pregnancy is OK. But it's not really a great time to like become a weightlifter <laughs> or like probably if you played the clarinet and you're a well-seasoned clarinetist, OK, you can probably play. But it's not probably the best time to st start to learn clarinet, you know. I think there's probably some truth to that. Like maintain your normal while you can, but don't take up anything new that's quite strenuous. But I, I hadn't thought about, again, this is my disconnect. I was thinking more about the pregnancy side. I hadn't thought about the afterbirth side, but you're really right. I mean, it can for some people, especially those who have a C-section, I mean, this is really a traumatic thing and you can run the risk of causing further problems. I mean, my furthest or my closest thing to relate to would be when I had my wisdom teeth out. They said, don't play your clarinet for, you know, six weeks. And like, for me, I was, I was in high school, so that wasn't such a hard thing to ask at the time. Um, but I, I, it was kind of hard towards the end because I was in all the school bands, marching bands and stuff. But they're like, no, no, if you do this, those sockets are going to blow up in your mouth. You're going to deeply regret it. Do not do it. <laughs> but I wondered if there was similar advice, yeah, I guess, for, you know, clarinet. And it sounds like there's not really a defined advice, you know? 
Yeah, and it really is highly individual. So I want to emphasize um, two things. Number one, that uh, many people can play the clarinet throughout their entire pregnancy and bounce back, you know, right afterwards, and and they're great and they're fine, and that works for them and their bodies. And so I never want to tell anybody. Um, like you can't do that or you shouldn't do that because for some people it, it seems to be a really good thing and that's what they want to do. Um, but for some people, even if they want to, they might not be able to. And I think that's important to realize. And I can talk about some stats in a bit uh, that I thought were really interesting from the, um, from the article. But another thing I want to emphasize is that the challenges during pregnancy are quite a bit different from the challenges after pregnancy. It really is kind of a, a two-part thing. And if you want, we can talk about, you know, what happens physically during that pregnancy and um, how that might affect clarinet playing. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. And then we'll dive into some stats. I had an amazing stat here I want to go into too, but let's do that first, the two parts kind of. Yeah. Yeah, so um, during pregnancy, I just wanted to take a look at what happens to the respiratory system and, and the muscles um, during pregnancy, and I'll just share a couple um, interesting things that I found. So most closely relating to the clarinet, to make room for the growing baby, everything sort of moves upward in the body. The organs are displaced upward, the rib cage expands up and out, and the diaphragm actually moves upwards in the body by one to four centimeters. So that's like a huge change in, you know, the, the musculoskeletal structure that we're using to play our instrument, right? There's a weight gain of 25 to 35 plus pounds that happens. And most of that, like 65% of that is going to be in the abdominal area too. But it's so amazing the way that the human body actually adjusts to that change so that the lung volume does not change. So the lung volume stays the same despite all of this, uh, you know, this baby and all the other viscera and the placenta and all this stuff that we have that's kind of displacing. So the, because the rib cage moves up and out, it maintains the same lung volume that we had. So I thought that was pretty cool. The muscles sort of thin and lengthen out and the function is reduced. And so um, we might not be able to have as much power um, and the lung um, reserves, so the body adapts so that we do get the same amount of oxygen in, and but we are not able to access the reserves that we might normally have during strenuous exercise. So that I think is the root of, uh, despite the fact that we are getting air, we might not feel like it, especially towards the end of pregnancy because we can't get to those reserves we might normally have. So those are some of the changes. Did you ever experiment with, uh, maybe not during pregnancy, but just in general, um, any of this like Wim Hof breathing or any of these other breathology type things? Have you ever looked into that? I don't think I'm familiar with those. What are they? Oh, basically just like deep breathing techniques. Um, some of them follow by a, a short bout of hypoxia, for example. Like Wim Hof, for example, you do a bunch of deep breathing and then you sort of exhale all the air and take a break. And the idea is sort of to spike the oxygen, but then let it come back lower than it normally would be. And it kind of yeah, it just sort of like recharges the body or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've done some yoga breathing techniques that probably relate to that. Yeah. And did you find any of that helps during or or did you... Uh... I think any amount of um, cardio exercise, just like walking and kind of maintaining that system and trying to get your heart rate up is probably good. But I'm not really sure about specific breathing exercises during pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. Again, everyone, this is not medical yeah. advice. I don't want to hear anyone say, oh, I, w I went to my doctor and I told them I was listening to Claire Neat podcast. Yeah, it would be great they to said... hear comments from people who are more knowledgeable, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I'd love some feedback if you've had any experiences, um, you know, with this as well. You can always reach out uh, via email and I'll pass anything along um, to Rachel that comes in as well. Hello at ClaireNeat.com. And uh, you can send those messages along, okay? If you do have questions or feedback or anything like that, I'd love to know your experience, like I was saying. Um, but uh, I, I find that so interesting that these, even these breathing exercises, like I remember my wife saying, she, I think she had to lay on her side when she was pregnant and couldn't lay on her belly or something, obviously. But even the back was apparently bad. And it, you know, so all this breathing and, and long tones and, you know, orchestral excerpts and long orchestra concerts, like this is maybe an off topic question that you, I guess you may not know the answer to, but like what kind of concessions are made or can be made or maybe should be made in the music industry for, for women in this position? Like I'm imagining an orchestral concert 
is not only difficult in your kind of second trimester, for example, but like maybe we should be having a different type of paid leave or, you know what I'm saying? Like how, how does this look versus how should it look? And what are your thoughts about that, that side of things? Oh, I have so many thoughts. Um, so first of all, the second trimester is for most people, the best trimester. It's actually like, <laughs> You're, you're usually pretty good unless you have some kind of serious issue. It's really the third. And in some cases, the first trimester when your body is, your body is creating a new organ. I mean, you're, you're building the placenta. It takes so much out of you. You can be so fatigued and morning sickness or nausea. Could, nausea could be um, worse in the first trimester too. So um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what people said from the survey uh, about how the different fun challenges of pregnancy affected their clarinet playing. But first, I do want to acknowledge I'm speaking from a United States uh, based from a, a North America perspective. And I have heard and, and my survey, I think probably mostly had responses from that area. But I've heard some things like from Germany, um, where they actually there might be some sort of concept that it's dangerous for a woman to continue playing pregnancy uh, during her pregnancy to continue playing. And I think it might, there's a lot of cultural differences that might happen. But um, let's talk about some of the uh, results from the survey. So I did a survey. I ended up with 57 respondents, all of whom were uh, clarinetists who identified as women who had given birth. So pretty specific demographics. I was really happy to get 57 people responding on this topic and try to get some sort of consensus. So the number one, I asked about what physical challenges of pregnancy affected your clarinet playing. And the number one thing um, mentioned by 86% of women was shortness of breath or difficulty taking full breaths. So that one's kind of obvious. 67%, um, so about two thirds of women said that fatigue affected their clarinet playing. I mean, it affects everything, right? You're just tired, you need a nap, you can't practice uh, if you're feeling so exhausted. Lack of air support was 59%, um, so that's a little bit different than feeling shortness of breath, but difficulty really supporting the air. Almost half of women reported the body changes affected their posture or playing position on the instrument. One interesting note was um, people. some people said they had difficulty actually playing the bass clarinet just simply because they couldn't hold it correctly. And I think it really, that depends on everybody's different body structure, but for some people that was an issue. For me, I was able to do it uh, up through month nine. I played a, a bass clarinet in a clarinet choir at 39 weeks pregnant with my second. Wow. <laughs> uh, almost just to show that I could. It was like I was trying to prove something to myself. Um, and I could still play it, but some people find that. Um, I want to talk about dizziness or low blood pressure. So 40% of women reported that that was an issue with their clarinet playing. I experienced that too, to where um, I would get dizzy if I stood up and played at certain points during my pregnancy. So that's one of the big things to keep in mind is you might need to sit. So it's important to think about if you've got a solo uh, performance coming up or something where you're planning on standing, you might just need to accommodate that by sitting. But then um, other people mentioned that they actually couldn't sit for long periods of time. So when you're pregnant, you can have a lot of swelling. We had 23% of people reported the swelling affected their clarinet playing. And you're actually not supposed to sit still for long periods of time, like on a plane, if you're pregnant, can cause um, issues, I think with like blood clots or something in your legs. People wear compression hose to help with that issue. So yeah, sitting there for playing a Mahler symphony or something um, in the orchestra, especially if you're there 30 minutes before and warming up and you're just sitting in this chair, that could be kind of challenging uh, to do that without moving around. So. It's just something to think about. And again, you never know how your body is going to react. You can try to plan and have backup plans, um, but you just don't know. Um, so some of the other fun things that people might experience that affected their clarinet playing, back pain, nausea or morning sickness, heartburn, acid reflux, carpal tunnel, a few people mentioned. If you, are, if you have carpal tunnel, you can be, it can be exacerbated by pregnancy. And in some cases, it can show up during pregnancy, even if you never had it before. Um, and high blood pressure can be an issue, as well as low blood pressure. So 
these are all the things that could affect your clarinet playing during pregnancy. So as far as accommodations, you know, maybe if you've got that bass clarinet piece planned, have a, a backup if you start feeling like you can't play the bass. Uh, some people have mentioned it was hard to carry the bass clarinet case, you know, that's a lot of lifting. So maybe have a, a roadie or, or get a wheel case so that you can um, take some of that pressure off yourself. So, but again, some people um, aren't affected by, um, by these things and, and they just can play along as normal. So that's important to keep in mind too. So I was going to say, I found an interesting correlation between some of your, uh, your data here. And that's that, you know, I'm not sure how many percentage of women reported some issue. Um, it must be at least higher than 86% though, because you said that 86% reported shortness of breath. So I think it's safe to assume that close to everyone reported something, <laughs> right? However, one thing that I noticed here is that, uh, over 49% reported that they continued to play in some capacity, and 23% who stopped were dis dissatisfied that they had to do so. So that's like over, you know, close to 70% that, that wanted to keep playing clarinet, you know? So that's pretty powerful <laughs> and shows the strength of the people involved, I suppose. Um, but is that something that we should really kind of push towards? Or like, what do you think? Because even some people were very dissatisfied to stop playing, like I said. Um, but... I want to talk about maybe the guilt associated with taking time off for parenting because I'm experiencing some of that um, as a father even. And, and you feel it from the community sometimes too. I don't know about where you live, but like there's some people who like chose not to have kids or whatever and they sort of see that you've some way given up your career. And I mean, in the short term, yeah, I mean, it's definitely like that for the first year or two. I mean, we have an eight month old right now. It's really hard to to continue normal life. You can't. But I'm trying to see it as a way like to try to enjoy their childhood. And I can always come back to the clarinet in a little bit. But, you know, maybe the honest truth is I have taken a bit of a career break. But I don't – there's like a bit of guilt and almost shame or something just around this whole topic. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah, I would love to. And um, I think it's just so important that we uh, normalize having families. And the pandemic really helped us do that because I think before – there was a lot more of like, I need to separate my work life and my family life. I need to pretend like my family isn't affecting my work in any way so I can show that I'm a good worker and that I'm committed to the music and all that. Um, during the pandemic, it was just like, all bets are off. You know, kids are running in half naked or in some cases all the way naked, at least in my house, um, during Zoom meetings and stuff like that. And there's just no way to pretend like having a family isn't... Um, affecting you know every aspect of your life it's who you are it's a part of you absolutely yeah i agree and i have to say that i've experienced a, a lot of that too like working from home for five years now i've i've had a lot longer experience with this than most and i remember early on in the pandemic some people started to call me and they were like you know, I have to work from home now. And I've, I know you've done it for a long time. What do I do? And I'm like, well, get off the phone, <laughs> do your work. <laughs> and that's the best way, you know, kind of is to just, you know, do it as if you're at work, but you still have to do the work. You're not going to call me and ask how to work from home all day. <laughs> you know, and I, I wasn't quite that blunt. I'm just being kind of funny, but it's true. Multiple people would call me every day for a little while trying to like get the gist of it. Yeah. And, you know, for the for a long time, at least in our society, we had this sort of model where the women would stay home and take care of the kids and take care of the family stuff. And the men would go to work for the most part. Um, and now we've moved to a dual income model where most families have uh, both parents working to some extent. But yet most of the domestic uh, labor still falls on the woman, even if she's working full time. And you can read, you know, there's a lot of interesting books and articles about that. So, um, yeah, it is, it's really challenging, especially for the person that's taking on a lot of the caregiving responsibilities to also have a career. And my hope is that as we see more and more dads like you stepping up and doing a lot of the, the caregiving and feeling more comfortable taking paternal leave, like uh, family leave is just so important. Normalizing taking family leave when somebody has a kid, like not expecting them to immediately come back into the office. Um, just expecting that, oh, you know, having a kid, that's great. Take your time, take what you need to do and um, 
use that time however you need to use for your family and we know you will come back after it. I had so much anxiety after my first son was born. I, I had these thoughts. I mean, it's common. Postpartum anxiety can be and depression can be a common um, thing that happens after birth. Uh, but I had a lot of thoughts like, oh, I'm never going to play the clarinet again. And, you know, everybody else is, is like getting ahead of me that don't they don't have kids and look at all the things that they can do. These kind of really negative thoughts. Um, and after a while, and I also lost a lot of motivation. It's just hard sometimes when you're focusing so much and you're so fatigued, you're so sleep deprived to um, get yourself in the practice room. And it can be this sort of negative uh, spiral. <laughs> but after a little while, I started feeling a lot better. I started getting back to playing more. And I realized, you know what? My career is still here. It's here. It's waiting for me whenever I'm ready to come back to it. And I really think that that is the best viewpoint to have that, you know, it, for anybody, for any reason, taking a break from your career, taking a year of, of leave to deal with an, uh, an aging parent that you have to take care of, um, taking a mental health break for a semester um, that because you're dealing with something that you need to get straightened out in your personal life. Let's normalize that and say, when you come back, we're welcoming you with open arms uh, back to your career. So I think that's the ideal way to, to handle it. And if you don't want to stop, don't stop. Keep going. Like, keep doing what you're doing and, you know, pay somebody to take care of your kids. That's great. It's all about what, what works for the family. Some women um, want to be home. They want to be home uh, caring for the baby for even, you know, up to six months, or they even decide they don't want to return to their career. Some women, after a couple weeks home with the baby, they're like, get me out of here. I want to go back to work, <laughs> um, you know, and it really just depends. And one another thing I found is that sometimes you might be a person that thinks you're going to want to go back to work, but then when you get in the situation, it doesn't feel right. It's like too soon. And on the other hand, you might think, oh, it'd be great to stay home and bond with my baby for, for three months and you start going nuts after a while. So it's really hard to predict how you're gonna feel. And one last thing, I know I'm going on a bit about this. I'm very passionate about this topic because I think if we understand it better and talk about it more, it really will help with uh, representation of um, women in our profession, especially at the, the higher levels. And um, so I think family considerations are really important. But I wanted to talk about how people felt about their decision, like you mentioned, to stop or continue playing throughout their pregnancy. So about 45, 46% of women stopped practicing and performing uh, by the ninth month. So almost half. And of those, about half of them were happy with that decision to stop. But like you said, half of them wanted to keep playing longer. So they might have had some physical issues. Maybe they got put on bed rest or something um, where they wanted to play or maybe they planned to play longer, but they just couldn't. Um, but then on the other side, as far as the women who continued playing, we had 54% of women continued to perform and practice throughout their whole pregnancy like I did. There was a subset of that that um, about 10% total of the people who responded to the survey were dissatisfied to have to keep playing. So they had to keep playing longer than they wanted to, maybe for career reasons, maybe they felt like they had to or they would lose their job. If you're a freelancer, you know, there's a lot of pressure to not turn down that gig. Or there's not as encoded uh, leave policies if you're a part-time employee in a, a smaller orchestra or something like that. Or if you're an adjunct professor, you're not going to qualify for the family medical leave and things like that. So yeah, all just important considerations if you are, if you're pregnant or con considering getting pregnant or if you're an administrator or a teacher uh, who's working with someone who might be headed towards that life event, important to think about. I definitely think that, that that is definitely something that freelancers are going to experience in a different way than those who are employed. And I think that in that situation, unfortunately, some of the anxiety and fear and dread or whatever I hate to say it, but it's kind of justified because you disappear from a freelance community for a year, 18 months. It's very hard to get back in. And I experienced that when I hurt my hand. I mean, back in 2016, I, I basically couldn't play for a year and kind of tried to come back to it. And just as I was getting sort of really back into it again, the pandemic hit. <laughs> so um, now I've got two kids and it's like, I'm not I'm not 
itching to get back into this local scene, but it would be nice to do some stuff again more, you know, and uh, it is tough to break back in once you've once you've sort of taken that break. But I do agree. I think we need to normalize um, a part of this sort of family part of being a musician. I think that so many have done it in the past. So many more will do it in the future. And this sort of notion that I've seen, especially with, you know, college age students of like, oh, that's just not for me. I'll never. Well, don't say that yet, because I, I know you hate when people say don't say that yet. But it, it really is true, because you're if you're in your early 20s, you don't know where you'll be in 10 years. Odds are that many people will choose to have children. And I think that's great, you know. Um, and you know what? If they don't, who's going to be your students? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to teach at those universities you want to be teaching at? You know, and uh, so I think it is important to have kids. And I'm not going to you know push that on anybody. But I, I also think that, you know it's just a very natural part of, of being a human and being alive. And, and it's so, I'm so lucky to have, you know, that in my life, I think anyway. So, but, uh, I, I love the fact that I think the most important part of your article really is that you wanted to raise awareness of this and, and provide some information for those looking for it that I think you couldn't find. And I, I think that that is really the best research or the best, anything that comes into his existence is something that comes from a real need. And, uh, and now there's something out there. So when, you know, women in a generation from now, or even, you know, the next few years, they go looking for this kind of stuff, they have, this is a starting point. And uh, I would encourage anyone listening, like, I think that this would be a great topic for some like even doctoral research or further study a book mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean i think that multiple instruments need to be approached i mean even musicians unions need to be approached with this topic and take it more seriously not just for mothers but for fathers and the whole whole parenthood umbrella i think it needs to just be you know taken more seriously and i don't want to get into a whole like activism <laughs> rant here but like yeah i think that like I think there's a place here to have a real discussion about where this should be going and, and could be going and how it's okay and or not okay if you don't want to do it that's fine too but like it's just a part of life and m music sometimes I think it's all about the, like if you're not in the practice room 10 hours a day you're not a real musician right and uh, there's some guilt associated with that so anyway I had a couple last questions for you one of them was just in general like you said you have a five-year-old and eight-year-old now is that correct uh-huh so in general um, do you have any just specific kind of parenting advice for those who are uh, coming into it from a musical perspective, like trying to find a schedule again or trying to incorporate music with your kids, things like that? Oh, sure. Um, number one, keep your reeds on an elevated surface. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when my, when I had toddlers, they're a little older now, but I had to work on reeds like on the top of a filing cabinet where they couldn't even see them because if they could see them, it's just very a tempting object to want to grab and chew on, you know. Um, so yeah, you gotta gotta keep an eye on your gear and make sure it doesn't get messed with. The time is just the biggest challenge. So uh, having kids is like the biggest long-term project that you've ever taken on. And um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you know that, Sean. It's just like oh, yes. your whole your priorities just really shift a lot. And um, especially in the beginning, when you first have a newborn, you are um, either breastfeeding or pumping, uh, somehow feeding the child eight to 12 times per day. So I think sometimes people don't realize that you're pretty much round the clock, like they eat, they uh poop, they go to sleep, they wake up, they want to eat again. And that cycle can be two to three hours at the beginning. Um, and then it sort of starts to stretch out and you start to get some more sleep eventually, even though it feels like it's going to be forever. So your whole life when you first have a newborn, it's just kind of this whirlwind of chaos, really, uh, for the whole household until you get settled and people get more on an even sleeping schedule. So when does practicing happen during that? Whatever you can make it happen. Um, I think you one reality, especially at first, is that you um, need to just, you know you're going to have less practice time. And so how can you still get uh, the quality, even though you might not have the quantity? And uh, one of the things that I realized is that I had to get so efficient with my practicing. Before I had kids, I would do, you know, a luxurious warm up. It would be 30 minutes uh, of a warm up and then I would start playing my real stuff. And after kids, it was like, I have 30 minutes to practice. I'm going to get going. So I got into this like five minute warm up routine just to kind of get everything started, do a little bit of long tones, do some register slurs, do some finger stuff. And then I'm like, all right, what is the emergency? What do I need to practice today? And uh, a lot of what I would do is targeted 
problem spots and I would just be like I know I can play the rest of this piece so I just need to you know make sure I get to this spot and this spot and if that's all I do I'm happy like maybe I solve one problem during that practice session or maybe I get one tempo up you know um, six bpm or something like that and I'm good with that and so you just have to be a lot more organized and um and just uh, 30 minutes becomes a long time if you really focus and you're really careful. I don't know, what did you find with that? Well, first of all, yeah, 30 minutes does become a long time. It's especially a long time to find uninterrupted, yeah. <laughs> I find, you know. It's like, you, you'll be surprised how long or short 30 minutes can seem, um, depending on the perspective of the time. And, you know, sometimes I found too, you know, you, the stars sort of align, like you get the kid down to bed for a nap and you're like okay I can practice or do whatever I need to do and let the nap doesn't last as long as you'd hoped or a car with a siren drives by and like all these things out of your control so I mean I guess for me that the thing I found and if, if we do have a third I'm not sure yet but if we do have a third I think I got a you mentioned the first three months and that I agree that's very difficult um I did not expect that the first time it was like being hit by a bus the second time I don't know why but I just like I'd forgotten the first time I basically just did it again I didn't take any time off from anything I just kind of tried to keep going but um there's some meme I saw that was like you know yeah kids eat every three hours and then the guy's like okay okay and it's like all day 24 hours a day and he's like what <laughs> you know and it's true. They're up every two to three hours, every single day for three months. So look at your day and, and you know, the eight hours of sleep you get to enjoy <laughs> and imagine not having that for three months. And in my case, actually, our, the problem is, is our, our newborn is actually sleeping through the night, but our four-year-old keeps waking up at night. I don't think I've actually slept through a night in two years. Mm -hmm. And you have to really, and I, it's, you know, it's funny, but it's like at the same time, it's like it is very, very hard to sustain your energy and, and live a normal life when you're not sleeping how you expect it to. And that, I guess for me, the biggest thing was just to sleep. And before we had our first child, one, one person told me, I said, the month before she was born, I said, well, what would you recommend during this time to prepare or whatever? And he said, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> just go to bed. I laughed. He's like, no, I'm serious. Go home and go to bed. <laughs> You'll wish you'd listen. The problem is sleep doesn't work that way. You can't like bank it up. But that reminds me of a really great uh, thing, a piece of advice that I heard from a friend, which was that if you want to have a family and you're a performing artist, really, but up to that point, you're um, when you're working on your technique and you're you're practicing and you're trying to come into your own as a player, it's kind of like you're putting money in the bank, you're depositing, you're, you're working, you're leveling up your skills. And when you have a family, when you start a family, you start making withdrawals. <laughs> and it's like, you gotta have that solid basis um, to build on so that even if you need to go into maintenance mode for three months where like, you're not gonna be learning that extended technique that maybe you always wanted to work on or something like that. You can still function, you can still be a decent player, you can still do what you need to do. Um, but if you don't have that solid basis of tone and technique beforehand, it's gonna be really hard to perform at the level you might want to during that time. I agree, I think that's the thing that helps you really refine it. What you said about the efficiency, actually, that's something else I experienced is that what used to take me all afternoon I had to find a way to do it in like half an hour, 10 minutes, you know, zero minutes, <laughs> whatever, right? Whatever you kind of had, you just have to make work. And I, I really relate to that. Everything from cleaning the kitchen to learning a piece of music to whatever, like you just learn to be so incredibly efficient. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that it's something that's kind of latent and then you sort of just learn to put it to use, which I think is actually actually really good. But um, yeah, I think there's definitely something to be said for just preparing, though. And I think that it would be a nice sort of maybe not a course in college to have, but some sort of like prep for like families for musicians or like life skills for musician or home economics for musicians. <laughs> I mean, it, this kind of thing, you know, I mean, there's so much kind of surprise. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've experienced this. I'm sure you have. Every parent does. But the one thing that amazes me is you think you've bought everything. And then like pretty much every day, there's something else you have to buy or you have to upgrade or this isn't good anymore. Is the car seat from the first pregnancy still OK? Or just it, like it's just, oh, my God, every day there's there's new things you have to buy and <laughs> consider that I didn't even know existed. They grow out of clothes so quickly. Yeah, your local your local, um, you know, buy nothing groups or um, online kind of giveaway groups or mom groups are your best friend because there's always going to be someone giving away a giant trash bag of 2T 
uh, boy clothes, right? When you're ready to give away your giant bag of baby clothes or something. So exactly, exactly. So your kids are getting a little older now. Mine are still, I guess, four and, and eight months. Um, so we're not quite there yet. But um, one thing I have noticed throughout my four-year-old's life so far, she's very, very attracted to music, like surprisingly so, very attuned ear. Um, and I'm not just saying that. I know every <laughs> parent would say that. Like, it's 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 true. Like, I'm really actually quite surprised. Um, and then the new one, too, she's very drawn to sounds and repeating pitches. And the, the kids are kind of communicating with, like, weird whale noises and stuff. It's kind of surprising. <laughs> but they're often, like, the same pitch, same staccato, same duration. Like, it's very interesting. Do you find that, um, you know, playing music throughout the pregnancy, do you think it influenced your children? Oh, I have no idea, but I do remember when I was pregnant with my second son, I was playing the um, the Schoenberg Chamber Symphony. I was playing the E-flat clarinet part, and I was practicing it, and um, I was pregnant with him, and I was looking up the stage of pregnancy, and I was like, oh no, this is right when he's developing his hearing in the womb, and the first thing he's going to hear is Schoenberg on E-flat clarinet. Like, what is that going to do to him? He's going to hate um, music. <laughs> So I thought that was kind of funny, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to tell nature versus nurture as far as musicianship goes, if they're just surrounded by it and how much of it is just like genetic. But um, definitely my kids have an interest in music too. And as they get older, it's kind of hard to know what to do as far as music lessons and things like that, because like, how do you foster that, but without pressuring them? Um, and I don't even know if I want my kids to have a career in music. It's too hard. <laughs> you know, like, Do something more lucrative with your life. Um, but I do, I know that I want them to enjoy music. And studies have shown that it's not just like listening to Mozart that makes your kids smarter or something. Music does have an effect on the brain when you do it in early childhood, but it's more about like making music and being involved in it. And I'll just share one thing that we've been doing recently in my family that the kids love, which is they call it the instrument game. And we have all these different musical instruments around uh, from, you know, maracas to tambourine to a, a mabira, a little thumb piano and a melodica. And we have them in this bin. And so they'll just choose some instruments and put them out in a circle. And we each start with an instrument and we do a little jam and try to make a little make some music and then after a minute or two we stop and then we rotate and then everybody goes to the next instrument and it's so much fun uh it's really great but we tried to teach my older son piano and he didn't want to listen to us um it was not a positive thing it was like during the pandemic and we were already bugging him about school stuff and everything else and he didn't want to he did, just didn't want to hear it from us now we've just started piano lessons with someone else and it is just like night and day difference it's uh I think it can be really helpful for them to learn from someone outside of the family. Yeah, we're going to try and lean towards that too, I think. We've started just doing some stuff on the piano with uh, the older one, and uh, she's really gravitating to it. It's interesting. Like She'll just walk by and be like, oh, I want to play Nanu. She calls it Nanu. I don't know why, but yeah, I want to play Nanu. And it's like, okay. So they sit down and they play for a little bit. And my wife's a piano teacher, so um, I mean, but she's not pushing her. Because when she was a child, I think like she was a child prodigy. So like from the age of like you know three or something, she basically practiced four or five hours a day until whenever, right? And she doesn't want to push that on her, um, which I think is fair. But uh, she's really enjoying it so far. But it's funny because when she first started to show an affinity for music, we basically said the same thing as you. I was like, uh, she she found this flute toy, one of those. Um, what's the company called? Nuvo a nouveau flute or something with a little mouthpiece thing. And she, we, I showed it to her and she immediately started playing it and loving it and running around. And it was a joke. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, wait, come play with this doctor kid. <laughs> like, um, let's, let's change this toy out. <laughs> yeah. I think the main thing is like we want, we can't control what they end up doing, but we can foster a love for music and all the positivity and joy that that can bring to our lives, you know? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I just want to say for those listening that if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any of those free platforms, the show will end here. But I encourage you to support the direct production of the show at clarinet.com slash join. And as a thank you for doing so. You'll get access to a few bonus questions and also ad free episodes in the future. So any last things to add here, Rachel, before we move into the lightning round? Um, yeah, I'll just mention that my article on clarinet playing during pregnancy and postpartum, it was published in the clarinet in the 
June 2022 issue, but it is also available online for anyone, whether or not you're an ICA member. So you can find that link um, at clarinet.org. Fantastic. Yeah, it was really a worthy read. And uh, I definitely think that it was an important topic to bring up. And that's you know why I invited you on the show here today. I think it's really important we get this sort of conversation started and out there. And uh, this is sort of the platform for that, too. So <laughs> thank you again for joining me today. And uh, do you have a website or something people should check out directly or? Sure. Yeah. Rachel Yoder Clarinet dot org is my website if people want to connect with me there. Perfect. I'll put a link to that in the description of this episode. Thanks so much for coming on, Rachel. Thanks. As musicians, we're always looking to improve our playing and understanding of music, but we are often hesitant to work on the business and marketing side. If you're looking to make more money teaching, fill up the gaps in your schedule and find ideal clients to work with who leave you energized instead of drained after a day of teaching, you need to check out clarinetist Kelly Reardon's Outside the Box community. Get a free 30-minute consultation and personalized recommendations from Kelly by mentioning Clarinet when you register at kellyreardon.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y-R-I-O-R-D-A-N.com. Also, you might want to check out her recent podcast episode with me, number 174 of the Clarinet Podcast. The new Bakun Q-Series clarinet features a completely redesigned bore inspired by the Bakun Custom Series clarinets. This means you can play and perform like the pros, but for less. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com to save 10% on your entire purchase and try the Bakun Q-Series or Protégé clarinet risk-free for 30 days. Just pay the return shipping if you aren't fully satisfied. Shop now at bakunmusical.com and use code CLARINET at checkout. Imagine a read that lets you focus on your music, lasts for months instead of days, and even saves you money in the long run. It's all possible with Legere Reads, the world's leading synthetic read brand made right here in Canada. The European cut read is preferred by Legere artists all over the world, including Eddie Daniels, David Schifrin, Crowder Giuffredi, and many others. It offers a warm, clean sound with a great ease of articulation and is now available for E-flat, B-flat, and the bass clarinet. Learn more at your local music store. Or you can now save 10% on your Legere reads with code CLARINET at checkout at legere.com. That's L-E-G-E-R-E dot com.